Welcome to Dozer Shop again. Uh, we're going to show some updates on the Brown and Sharp 13 uh, Universal Cylindrical Grinder. Let me walk you on over here. All right, you got the 13 uh, rocking and rolling. Got the elevation head in the column for the grinding wheel put on it. And that's the latest progress. I don't think I showed that before. Um, it sits on the saddle there, the turret part, I guess you'd call it. And that goes on there, and uh, I got, got the bolt on there, and I got the uh, actual uh, casting that goes up and down that carries the grinding spindle on the elevation uh, part there. And there's, of course, the, uh, the gearbox that cranks it up and down. Um, I wanted to show you guys something me and my buddy Mark were discussing um, on his 13. Uh, my friend Mark's got one, and he was uh, in, in uh, Grand Island. And he was saying that he had some uh, slight vibration in the finish, and we got to talking. I said, "Did you tighten the uh, the gib lock for the elevation axis, which is right there? There's a, uh, a set screw in there, and uh, I think you need a three sixteenths Allen wrench to, to snug it up." And uh, he said, "No. Uh, what what gib screw? Uh, what what gib lock?" And sure enough, this one in the middle there, he didn't realize that he had one because he had a, I guess a broken off bolt, you know, a bolt with a head, a, a hex head or some kind of headed bolt, and it was broke off flush. And uh, yeah, so uh, I got to talking to Mark and he uh, he drilled it out or got it out or something. And he's like, uh, it was all painted over and rust and, and grease and he didn't even know it was there. So now he's able to lock his gib, and like I say, the gib is right under here on this side, under the uh, the felt cover, the way cover. There's the gib. So there's a couple. That's a gib screw. That's a gib screw. That one and that one go straight in um, to secure the gib, and this one comes in at an angle, and that's the locker screw, bolt, whatever you want to call it. So. For all you guys with another Brown & Sharp 13, that's how that works. Um, you might find it interesting, this bolt and this bolt hole, there's little bolt plugs in there. Brown & Sharp has a spindle extension that goes on the taper, it's got a, a bushing of sorts, and then another taper, and you can move the wheel flange out, you know, three, four inches, and it's just like a, uh, like a bearing support that bolts on there um, to extend the spindle out another couple inches. Um, so I have one. I got it in my pile of stuff. I don't know where it is. I'll show you guys. But anyways, that's on um, on the machine, and uh, that's all clean. Uh, I showed you guys how I cleaned it all. This is just a. Uh, see, some machines have single groove pulleys, and some have multi groove pulleys. This is a plastic, um, just a little plastic thing that goes in place of the the the. The, the, the flange adapter. You can put a wheel flange adapter on this side and run a grinding wheel on this side. And this is just a plastic thing that protects the taper. But the uh, the pulley, uh, they made the spindles with multiple, I think three grooves or single grooves. And I'll, I'm going to show you that. Here, let me go on the back side, right um, around the back. I'll show you. I don't have the motor mount on yet, but you're going to see uh, for a eight bolts, the motor mount goes on. And I'll show you that in a minute. And that's, that's fairly easy to put on. Um, so that's how that's going to go. That's for the electrical cabinet, which is over there. I don't know if I'm going to put that back on because I might want to put it up against the wall and I'm going to gain myself a couple you know, inches if I don't put it on the back. I might put it on the side, but it's actually going to stick over by like two or three inches, which might be okay. Um, See, I might put it on the side, or I might. Ha I got a Hoffman panel, 20 by 20 by 8 inches that I could put on there. So I'll figure something out. But anyways, what I want to say about let me walk you over to my spare spindles I got. Yeah, some of them had uh, okay. That's the bottom one here. That's a uh, an oil lubricated. Uh, bushing spindle. Those are felts, I guess, um, with tension springs. So that that's a, oh yeah, the multi-groove pulley. Here's a ball bearing 
with a single pulley, another ball bearing with a multi-pulley, and there's a ball bearing with a single pulley. So you can have different ones, and, that, and that's the workhead motor. I'll get, get to that in a minute. But the motor for it, the grinder, has uh, three sh uh, shivs on the pulley. So that goes on the single one. You got to shift it side to side. So to shift it side to side, okay. Here's the uh, the motor mount, and that bolts on the back, and it's just like a 90 degree angle plate. So so that goes on the back um, when the motor rides on there. And see, there's a dowel pin, half inch dowel pin there, half inch dowel pin there. And that goes in this. This is a plate that sits on there that the actual motor bolts to and this is to allow this slot is to allow the plate to slide side to side for pulley alignment and like I say it it rides on those dowel pins like a key uh, of sorts it's kind of keyed in there so this thing uh, that's like I say the motor goes on that and I think there's some yeah little indicator lines for which pulley groove you gotta line it up you know center or left or right and, and that's the tension adjustment for in and out but anyways this sucker boy it's like 25 pounds I mean it's heavy you know and this joker here I mean it's fairly sizably it's heavy too so um, sidebar that hole those two holes are for a counter shaft when you have the internal grinding spindle for doing ID grinding. A shaft goes in there and I think a pulley or something goes on there and a flat belt goes to the, I hope you go in this way, to the internal grinding attachment which bolts to these T-slots. That's the internal grinding attachment attachment points. So I said all that to say this, this thing's like 20 pounds, that thing's 20 pounds. And I'm wondering why Brown and Sharp um, designed it to be put on there with uh, so so, so uh, such a heavy weight, because this whole spindle up and down casting is fairly heavy too, and it's like cantilevering off the back. You know, it bolts there, cantilevers off the back, and you got the subplate and then the motor. It is a sizable bit of weight back there. So let's see, you're putting the top of this. Uh, dovetail in compression and it wants to the weight wants to roll it forward and you're, you're unloading you know the bottom part of the dovetail it wants to roll out and uh, so you're you're actually putting the, the the angle part of the dovetails in in compression there and then the face would be Sorry, in there, uh, would be in compression there. So it wants to twist the whole thing from the weight on this little shelf coming out there. And I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea. I guess Brown and Sharp might have done it for a reason. But it's interesting, my buddy Mark, his machine, that uh, motor bracket, the angle bracket, is aluminum, where mine is iron. And his is an earlier machine from, I think, the 50s or the 60s. I think it's from the 50s, Mark's machine. But anyhow, I'm wondering why Brown and Sharp switched to, uh, and like I said, this is a 1980s machine, early 80, 81, something like that. I wonder why they switched from aluminum to iron. It kind of perplexes me. But I just thought that was a lot of weight. And not that you ever move this guy up and down, the wheel head up and down, unless you're sharpening end mills and, you know, who knows whatever else. But I'm mostly going to use it for a cylindrical grinding. Um, properties of uh, this machine so I won't be moving it much and I'll probably put it back on there but we were talking first of all let me step back I thought it'd be cool if you had a, a flat plate of aluminum like half inch or five eighths or something and come up and put the motor above the uh, um, the whole head and then put the belt back down to the drive pulley I, that hand wheel will get in the way, but I mean this thing it's it swivels you loosen that and it the whole you know, casting box moves but you know uh, there's no, I guess no reason to re-engineer what I got 
I just found it was interesting that this, man, there's a lot of cantilevered weight on this guy. So it doesn't matter. I was just thinking out loud, why did Brown and Sharp change that? And then like, I thought it might've been for chatter, uh, added rigidity, mass, uh, prevents, you know, your cutter wheel from chattering, whatever. Um, but the old machines, pre-1950, I think, pre-1950, the, the motor, you know, it was all line shaft driven off pulleys in the base, and they had a flat belt that came up through the, the center of the, the turret assembly and actually drove the spindle with a flat belt and went down into the base. So you would never have had this on the early, early machines. I think they made them from 1910 or something beginning and they changed it in the 1950 I think 51 um, to the more modern style with the motor on the the wheel head so <laughs> that's just my musings on that and but uh, I'm probably gonna just put the motor brackets back on and just you know but as an engineer I always question why things are designed the way they are because I mean I'm always learning and I'm always trying to figure things out and you know uh, why did they do it that way learn from the past I always like to say so anyways um oh what else I got going here I got the uh, the work head that goes on the table apart and I just, <laughs> I kind of took it apart to clean it, but it's also just so heavy. I want to put it on the machine in pieces. So there's the base. Oh, sorry that this, the base is in the parts thing. Um, this is the spindle. And it's like some left-hand threaded. Um, a brown and sharp number seven goes in there. It's got a very small, I think, half inch or seven sixteenths drawbar uh, hole that goes through there. Um, and then this is the... Uh, counter shaft but I got that apart I'll do a little maybe another video on that because there's a little bit to it but I say I got a pile of parts I got a whole bunch of attachments for that thread spindle you got face plate face plate chuck adapter chuck adapter chuck adapter and some other adapters such so I got a lot of parts with this guy and uh, so I'll, I'm, I'm thinking I was going to change the spindle, and I'll maybe, there's my other spindle, I'll make that into another video. Um, but for the, for the meantime, I think I'm just going to use that spindle as it is. Man, don't ever cheap out on air fittings. They like to leak. You buy the cheap ones. So that's this video for now. Today I'm going to try and get the motor brackets put on. I have some parts in the parts washer. I got a nice buck four inch four jaw chuck that goes on the, uh, the, the, the work head. That's the top from the work head. There's the swivel base for the work head that allows it to uh, go on the table right there is where it was. You can kind of see. So just a quick update. Well, this is a little bit longer update, but just wanted to give you guys the, uh, the glimpse of uh, this uh, wheel head put on and adjusted uh, set up and uh, just a little bit on the progress of this machine it's been a little slow um, been kind of tired after work and uh, had a busy week at work good week at the factory but uh, um, I still got my other machines got the Hendy to put back together and uh, a Colchester uh, 17 inch that thing uh, I don't got too much more to do I got the casting for the power feed over there in the gort, and I got to remachine a bore and put a, a, a make a bronze bushing for it. So that's kind of the update um, from Doozer Shop. Oh, quick, I got a vice, bought it on eBay. It's a gem, number one. There we go. Wanted to show uh, you guys this. It's a gem number one. Thing is unused. I don't think there's ever been work held in it at all. You know, there's, there's no. There's no evidence of ever being used in the jaws. No bolts have ever been in the, the slots. Um, uh, yeah, gem number one. My friend Jim on Grand Island has a gem number three, I believe. And I've just, that's the first time I heard a gem. I marveled at his, and I just, I saw one on eBay. I had to buy it. So uh, I thought that was really cool. So from now, uh, for now, do the shop. See you later.